But ladies and gentlemen, that was Across the Bridge of Hope, which in many ways is a fantastic idea for us to hold in our hands today at this meeting. And it now gives me great pleasure to introduce two wonderful people, speakers, and great friends, Lola Dare and Anders Nordstrom. Please give them a warm welcome. Now, Lola has a title which doesn't do justice to who she is. It says here that she's from the Center for Health Sciences Training Research. Lola's just quite simply the most fantastic civil society activist and influencer you are ever likely to meet. Every meeting I go to, <laughs> every conference I attend, Lola's voice is deeply passionate and influential and speaks with an authenticity that, frankly, few of us can command. At the same time, Anders Nordstrom, who's had a series of remarkably influential positions in his career in global health, now sits at the apex of leadership in terms of global health diplomacy, not only, please, in Sweden, but also as the person who has led the health thematic of the post-2015 development agenda discussions, has drawn together a truly global conversation to think about the future of health on this planet. We couldn't have two better people now for the next 30 minutes or so. Each of them is going to make a few opening remarks, and Lola is going to begin. Anytime Richard flatters me, I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I come from Nigeria, and many times also that is trouble. But I also represent a large group of civil society organizations in a network we call Global Health South. And we prepared. We prepared for the Botswana discussion. We prepared our priorities, and we came understanding that global health belongs to us in low and middle income countries. It's meant to serve us. It is our right, even if we don't have the resources and our governments never put the resources to it. And so we came prepared to ensure that the priorities reflect our realities. We must thank the government of Sweden and Botswana for providing us with the platform for those voices. But in Botswana, I learned, I learned in Botswana that the whole world does not have malaria and polio is not the only vaccine that the global community has a responsibility to provide to everybody. That's cervical cancer. I saw people with sciatica, I left Botswana with chronic backache and, and, and limping. I saw communities who came to argue for access to so many things that we really don't care about. I've listened to Hans Rosling this morning and I've seen the difference between a global aggregate and the reality we face at country level in many countries in Africa. We're still grappling with communicable diseases. We're still grappling with diarrhea. We're still grappling with an unfinished agenda where we say in the African Union, no woman should die giving birth and giving life to another. We're still grappling with all of those things. Yet in Botswana, I learned that the global aggregates may no longer reflect our realities, that climate change is important. And thank you. Climate change is also part of what we must pay attention to, to health. I learned in Botswana that the global resources would affect global aid, that many countries are turning the tap on global aid and saying, we have to attend to our realities. We have to attend to our people. I've spent the past five weeks in London listening to poor David Cameron, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Richard, listening to poor David Cameron, struggling to provide health care to British people. And suddenly I realized, should my priority be the priority of his taxpayers? I don't have an answer. Should the fact that they need to provide a global equity to any product that saves lives needs to be available at the same time in New York as it should be available in Kigali and in Nigeria? Is that a right we should have in the post-2015 agenda? Should that right also confer on us some responsibilities that we must take on to our governments? Because 
I don't think I can hold Cameron responsible for the women that die in northern Nigeria, for the failure of the Nigerian government to put its own domestic resources and ensure that from Kano to Lagos, healthcare is available. I also learned that health is an intersectoral issue. We're not going to do it alone. We're going to have to work with others if health is going to be an accessible and universal quality to all. So I left Botswana. I agree with the goals in Botswana. We all agreed in glo the Global Health South. Two goals, probably three. One goal to which we all must contribute, irrespective of sector, irrespective of what our main issues are. A goal that we must live in a planet that protects us all, and we must protect that planet for all of us. I don't know if anybody disagrees with that goal. So we do have a vision that we all agree with. We do have one voice that all of us can contribute to in health, in education, anywhere. We have one voice we can contribute to. We have a second goal. That goal is a health sector goal. Universal health coverage and access, preventive, promotive, health system strengthening. We have that goal. I don't know the words in its exact term, but we agree with that goal. I think it's time to stop discussing goals and targets because I think we all have a shared vision we can key into. The key question is, how shall we do it? How shall we do it? I also learned that the process of the MDG has created competition for resources, competition for priorities, competition by the global health initiatives to say we have gl this global health program, it is a priority. I have the mistake of trying to imagine I'd be Minister of Health in Nigeria, but I would only be Minister of Health for 10 minutes. In those 10 minutes, I would receive my colleagues from WHO. It's 9 o'clock. And somebody's coming to tell me, it's got to be adolescent health. It's 5 past 9. And somebody's going to tell me, it's got to be non-communicable disease. It's the most important thing. Can our governments have one plan that the donors will respect? Can we look at country priorities and respect those country priorities? So I say, at the end of the day, we left Botswana identifying the elephant in the room. It's a nice, friendly elephant. The mice can play around the elephant. But we created cats, three cats, three angry cats. When I was in school, my mother used to tell me, bell the cats. I told a colleague of mine, I'm going to tell them in Sweden, we need to bell the cats in global health if we're going to achieve any target, whether it's a development goal, whether it's a health goal. We did not achieve the MGD at the time we said we will achieve it. We have looked at all declarations and treaties since Alma Atta in 1978 to date. None of them have been achieved at the time we all agreed we will achieve it. And so as we set new goals, we need to really critically look at how we are going to ensure that in 2013 or 2030, we don't come back and say, oh, well, there are good reasons why some of us have achieved it and some of us are still struggling to do it, and then we need to move on to the next thing, and then some of us are worried that global aggregates will drop. So we need to stop this competition and come and leave Sweden and go forward from Botswana with one voice. Partnerships are going to matter in that one voice. How do we structure partnerships in a globalizing world where economies are different and realities are rapidly changing, innovation must be deployed, advances in biomedical sciences and innovations in products must not leave any country behind at the global level. What kind of partnerships do we need? Accountability is going to be important. We must be accountable, not because we report, but we have strengthened the voice of citizens and civil society to demand. I loved five weeks of lying on my back in the beautiful country of United Kingdom. I saw people demand for services. I saw people question governments in ways that I couldn't dare to question African governments without ending up in a place where you all would have to try all your best to get me out. We need to have voices at country level that can demand that kind of accountability of our domestic resources. My prime minister, if we have one, we have a president, is responsible for me. He must put my domestic resources where it matters. He must not put all our domestic resources in two initiatives because global, ini global initiatives demand that we must eradicate two things. While the masses of Nigerians are suffering from things that are not in the global radar at all. Accountability must also be very important at the global level, but it's in a different way. It must be independent and it must include our voices and reality. 
I'm very happy I spoke bes before Anders. We very seldom agree on many things. So I'm going, to <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask him a question that I hope he will answer. Can you help us bail the cat? There are three cats. There's the cut of the global health initiatives and global health programs. They are mobilizing significant resources. We appreciate them. They are the cuts that help us to bring money to these issues. They are the cuts that help us with appropriate policies. They are the cuts that help us fund innovation. But these cuts are very, very, very confident in themselves, but they're very frustrated with us. When are you going to do something different? So they are an angry cat. We mice don't know how to make them accountable at the country level. There is also the agency cuts, and he's been in WHO, he's been in many of these agencies who are competing <laughs> for these resources. It's my priority, it's my program. They are angry cuts, they are not complacent cuts, they are angry cuts. The global initiatives are taking away the money from us. They are, we, have, we are also, they're saying to countries, can you help us with the global initiatives? They in themselves have lost capacity, mandates have overlapped, they are unclear. How are we going to make the difference? in 2030 or 2050 if we don't bail the angry cats of the agencies. They are the country cats. I am a country cat. We are frustrated. We are banging on our tables. We are banging with our governments. We are saying we want services from district. I want to be able to do what I've done in England in the past four weeks. I want to be able to do it in Nigeria. Even sometimes when you have money in your pocket, you can't buy what is not available. Can these services be available? How do we make them available? It doesn't really matter to us at the end of the day, whether it's malaria, it matters to me that it's chronic backache, but it may matter to the next person that is maternal mortality. What it matters to us is whatever the package is, can we have access to it? We are frustrated cats. Can you build the cat? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for both the question and the challenge. And I, I feel I have got at least two, uh, I mean, cat with two heads, at least the first two heads, not the third one. But I think what we need to get is then, as Lola is calling for, is more accountability. We need more bells that are actually ringing when we are not behaving, when we are not really looking into the best of the people's health, but we are rather doing trying to do something else. So I would be very happy to get that bell around my neck if I have one or two necks or heads, I, I'm not sure. But your point, I think, is extremely important. It's not just about setting an agenda. It's about how we implement that agenda and how do we ensure that we keep ourselves and our partners accountable to actually both doing it in terms of the substantive priorities, but also how we do it, how matters just as much as the what's. But if I start by saying a couple of words around the what's, this is now Global Health Beyond 2015, and where, where did we come from? In 1998, people were preparing them for the Millennium de Declarations, and some people were then sort of making up the present MDGs. The world looked quite differently then what it does today. Let me say first that we have achieved a lot just looking back, and I think it's important to remember that what we have today in terms of access to HIV AIDS treatment, we didn't have. What we see today in terms of uh, declining um, rates of malaria wouldn't have been possible, I would say, without the MDGs. There is a number of examples where we see actually improvements, but there is, of course, an enormous big unfinished agenda. I'll, uh, I'll get back to that. But what is different now? What do we know about the future? What do we do know about the next 15 or 20 years? If I look back 20 years, uh, we didn't know about the impact of HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. Will we have a new epidemic coming now during the next 20 years? We can't, we don't know. So I think that needs to be part of our equation here, to have also resilience in order to be able to cope with new challenges as well. But we knew if there are a few things that we don't know, knew, no. And Hans was sharing the, the latest data in terms of the global burden of disease this morning or earlier this morning, and there's a very clear sort of shift here in, so in terms of the health needs, and I wouldn't say disease needs, the health challenges are changing. We see a declining rate of communal diseases, so-called de communal diseases, and we see an increase in terms of non-communal diseases, and we'll hear more about this this afternoon. That we know. We know also that the kind of risk factors that are affecting people's health, we heard about water, uh, we know that those risk factors are changing as well. Again, in the Lancet in December, you show very clearly that the risk factors associated with the non-communal diseases are going up. 
hypertension, intake of salt, lack of physical activity, uh, eating habits, all of those risk factors up. The risk factors associated with the community diseases are being reduced. So, and we see the clear correlation in between this. What we also know is that we today live in a much more connected world, uh, which is both a pro and a con. I mean, there are risks with being more connected, but there are also, of course, huge advantages with this. Uh, and that is something that we need to take in. We need know also that what Lola was saying, systems matters. How do we implement that matters a lot. And we know also the lessons from the present MDGs that we don't have to look beyond just national averages because when we go into countries, we see that there are huge gaps in between people uh, in terms of their actual outcome. So this consultation that we have been running now during the last six months, and uh, Lola was mentioning Botswana, the meeting ended, or, or this process ended uh, in quite uh, an interesting consultation or dialogue in Botswana some months back, but the consultation has been much, much more than just the Botswana meeting. Mm -hmm. We have had 1,600 people participating in different face-to-face -face meetings across the world. Uh, we have had hundreds of papers being submitted. We have had a web page where people have interacted. It's still open. It's uh, wor the world we want 2015. And we're going to come up with our final report now in 10 days' time. We're going to present it first time in Washington, back to back to the World Bank Spring Meeting. What are the messages that are coming out from this, Stan? First, uh, health as we also heard Joan calling here, the links in between environment and health. It's one example that health is both a mean to development, to sustainable development, but you can also use health as an indicator to measure. And I highly enjoyed some of the things Joan said earlier on here today, that we can, we can push health as a way to see are we getting it right. Are we getting it right when it comes to managing the big challenge in terms of climate change, the sort of more intermediate challenges in terms of managing the, our water resources? All of this we can actually measure in terms of whether this has an impact on people's health. The second message that is coming across is that we ha do have, even if I said we have been making some progress on the present MDGs, there's a huge unfinished agenda. Mm -hmm. Still 6.9 million children are dying each and every year. Uh, majority of those are dying during the first months of life. We need to pay more attention to this. We still have people that do not access HIV AIDS treatment. Second message. Third message is that we need now also to take on that there is a double burden of disease or health challenges also in the low income countries. We see an epidemic exploding now in terms of diabetes, also in Tanzania and Kenya, etc. And that needs to be brought into this equation. And the last one is then the message health systems matters. So, new agenda, what emerged in, in uh, Botswana, Lola already shared a little bit on that. Let me be slightly more concrete in terms of some of the key elements of that agenda that came out of Botswana. A possible overarching global goal for health being maximizing healthy lives. Meaning that we need to be able, as I said, to measure that we're making an impact in terms of people's health. It's not just about surviving any longer. Surviving is important. But we need to ensure that the number of years we are living, we are living healthy lives. We stay healthy. This is important from a macroeconomic point of view. It's important for you as an individual. In Sweden today, I say I'm married to a midwife, and she says that every child that is born in Sweden today have the possibility of living until 100. Uh, quite a horrifying sort of... <laughs> 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 but, but still, <laughs> we need, if we're going to live that long, for all reasons, if we're going to be able to work, to be productive, to be able to also manage our health costs, we need to stay healthy. We need to add more healthy lives to the total life expectancy. An overarching goal that could potentially be there, that is relevant for Sweden, it's relevant for Nigeria, it's relevant for Botswana. Mm -hmm. Second, what came out here is also, we need to continue and accelerate the present MDG agenda. We must not lose focus on that. <laughs> third element of this agenda is that we need to add on now the emerging health challenges in terms of the non-communal diseases. And we have a, an agreed global goal here from, from WHO in terms of reducing uh, mortality for, and uh, we'll hear more about this this afternoon, uh, on NCDs by the two thou year 2025 with 25%. And then the mean, main mean in order to get there, and the goal in itself, as Lola was saying, ensuring universal health coverage and access. And that has to do with an integrated way of providing those services. This has to do with fairness of financing. How are you actually going to be able to afford this? You have the right 
to have access to hell, but you actually need to pay. But you should pay according to ability to pay, and you should pay when you're not at most risk when you are sick, basically. So those, this is the agenda that is emerging. Um, three final comments, because this might sound that there is a deal, but I think there are at least three dimensions where there are still a lot of debate ongoing. First, um, should this be a health agenda or should it be a health sector agenda? There's no agreement on this yet. Are we focusing on what we can do within the health sector in terms of health services, or are we opening up and making this a health and development, a human development, a planet agenda. And here there is still a level of not people being comfortable. WHO is not comfortable here. Ministers of health are not comfortable because they feel that they can't be held accountable for something that somebody is going to do in, in the Minister of Agriculture or in the Minister of Infrastructure. And that's a big issue right now. The second issue here um, is around whether this should be a universal agenda or whether we should focus this new global agenda primarily on what has been linked to development assistance, aid, and then the worst part of what we have in the world in terms of eradicating extreme poverty. Can we, should we do only that, quote unquote, or should we have an agenda that is also relevant for Sweden, Tanzania, etc.? And the last one is then still no agreement, I would say here. How do we in some way package this agenda, is it primarily continuously focused on specific diseases and health problems? Malaria, HIV, AIDS, or do we now make a move to say that universal health coverage and access is a way of both respecting the priorities of countries, mm -hmm. but also delivering service in a way that is more integrated and is more fair, and also ensuring that we build an effective health system. So they are still, I think, a debate that is ongoing, but the bigger picture in terms of uh, where to position health, what should be the substance. I think we have quite a good story right now. Thank you. <laughs> but that's all it is, Anders, isn't it? A story. All these conversations, all these papers, all these meetings in Botswana, and where did it lead us? The high-level panel led by the, the United Kingdom government Liberia and Indonesia went to Bali to decide on the future of the planet. And they wrote three pages. And the word health does not appear once in those three pages. What went wrong? Put in Bali in context. Anders. Uh, your analysis of what the Bali meeting was about went wrong. <laughs> because the Bali meeting was not about that. This particular meeting is, was the third in a series of meetings, and they're coming to the final meeting, and they're coming to the final report. This meeting was not about health. Of course, they discussed partnerships, they discussed financing. One could have used health as an example then in the Bali discussion. Uh, they did. If you read Healthy the forests. No, uh. no, no. Healthy people. There were quite a few background papers going into this. One from my minister, together with Grasa Marcel from but South Africa. But not in the three pages. Not in the three pages, because that was about how do we ensure that we get partnerships, financing right, because that was the theme of the Bali meeting. So I'm quite still, uh, there is still um, work to be done on that panel, and I'm quite optimistic that we're going to get help there as well. There's still work to be done. I think that was a criticism. That's good, that's good. Now, Lola, you used the word right, and we heard this morning from Hans Rosling that we can't have everything. We're gonna have to make choices. And yet the discourse around global health and We've certainly been part of that, I've certainly been part of that, is the idea that health is a right for people. But is that a useful idea still when we heard from Hans that not everybody can have a hip replacement? Well, what is the place of this idea of health as a, as a human right in the future of global health? No one should take away health as a human right, no one. Health is a human right. What we need to add to the perspective of rights is that with every right comes a responsibility. And we have responsibilities of different stakeholders to protect, promote, and provide the enabling environment for that right to be expressed. Governments are a part of expressing that rights from north to south. And so, when we cannot take away the rights to health care from people, we also need to recognize how much we as governments can provide 
to people and how much people themselves need to take responsibility by not smoking. Sometimes smoking is addictive. How do we help people to protect their health? And so I do not think that there is a, there is a, there is a disconnect between the responsibility to provide and the rights of people to demand for what they must have to protect their own lives. So there is no disconnect between rights and responsibilities, and there is no disconnect between the rights and the capacity of governments to provide. When governments have to make very, very difficult decisions of their domestic resources and decide what to provide, it needs us to engage communities themselves as part of their rights to health to discuss that and not impose and be prescriptive and say, this is what we will provide with this money. That is missing from the rights argument. The engagement of communities in deciding what priorities that the resources that are not finite must take on. But rights are rights, and they must be protected. Very good, very good. But let me ask a question to both of you. If we're going to deliver this agenda, we need to have the right institutions that support these big ideas, whether they be global health, resilience, protecting the planet. And in health, as we heard this morning from Aaron, we have the World Health Organization as our, in a sense, prize yeah. agency, the only global health agency that we have. We have to look after it. But if you walk through the corridors of WHO in Geneva, it feels a sad place. First of all, the corridors are mostly empty. Rooms that were once a decade ago bustling with ideas and people running through those corridors, are now quiet. WHO has been going through a reform process, but to many of us, we see that reform process as actually a process of contraction and withdrawal from many of these debates. And as you've worked at WHO through some of these critical moments, help us to understand a little bit about what WHO can do over the next few years, and what are its major challenges as our prized global health agency? I would say to start that, um, I mean, agreeing with you that there is a need for much more work to revitalize WHO, to get WHO back in terms of the quality, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of the work. Uh, but, I mean, the asset is still there in terms of people's appreciation for WHO. There's nothing else in WHO. We need WHO. There's a total global agreement on that. And yep. that we need to capitalize on. Yep. My, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> My personal view in terms of what needs to be done, uh, just two things. Uh, first, I think WHO needs to be much more clear in terms of health and what is the health agenda. A little bit what we're speaking about here. Uh, my personal view is WHO is still a medical organization. WHO is not really taking in and is, uh, do not feel comfortable really tackling, if I simplify it a little bit, other health issues as UNAIDS has been tackling HIV AIDS. HIV AIDS is a, in some way a good example, a sad example of where we have opened up people's mind in the world that health matters. HIV has severe effects on people's health, survival, but also in terms of the economic situation in countries. Severe effect possibly on security and stability. That was why they, they discussed it at the Security Council. Never happened with any other health matters. WHO needs to take on that kind of approach to health, and they're not doing that today. So that's the first thing. That will give more energy into WHO again, and to dare to do that and to challenge the world on that. Mm. Second one is the level of quality in terms of what they provide in terms of support and collaboration with you in Nigeria. And I must say, I feel ashamed sometimes, or not sometimes, quite often, going then to country offices, and I do not see the level of quality at in the WHO offices. So there is a need for a major reform, and I'm not so worried about that, it's a little bit more quiet in Geneva. But where it matters most is in Nigeria, it's in Botswana, it's in Liberia, and WHO is not up to the kind of standard that we would like to see. And that needs to be addressed now. And I think Margaret Chan has the opportunity, there are some reforms ongoing, but she needs to be challenged by us and as member states, and we need to take, take, take the responsibility as member states as well. Very good. Lola, what would you like to see WHO do more for you and Nigeria? I'm going to speak as the convener of Global Health South. And I'm going to say that it's very interesting that we need WHO. Yes, we do. 
we need WHO to do what it was set up to do. Normative standards, surveillance, guidance. There's so many things we need WHO to do. So we need to keep WHO alive and kicking. But we needed to do something differently at regions and country level. We needed to stop saying to us, we are servants of governments and we do what they need to do. We are servants of governments <laughs> and we do what they need to do. But they're actually doing nothing. And so if action as we go forward is at the country level, WHO country offices, WHO regions need to do something differently. I want to take a different perspective from Anders. He's not surprised. <laughs> I don't think that WHO can lead global health if we define health action as intersectoral. We need to think outside the box. We need to look at how these global institutions are currently structured. Well, the competition between the mandates that are legitimate of the agencies needs to be something we have the courage to address and align. We need the UN. So if Margaret Chan were to begin to advocate for water, advocate for climate change, advocate for education, advocate for, is she the Secretary General of the UN and what is the Secretary General responsible for? And so health. we, <laughs> health, <laughs> so is he responsible for health as well as Margaret Chan is responsible for health? We need clear signals from the global institutions about who to hold to account. This diffuse mandates, this overlapping discussions that make it difficult for me to say, Minister for Water Sanitation, can you provide water so that I don't need to ask the Minister for Health to leave his primary responsibility to go and ask for water. Once Margaret Chan becomes the champion for health in an intersectoral way, whereby WHO becomes responsible for everything that it takes us to live in healthy planets and to be healthy people, it tapers down to country level and my ministers I'm sorry to say, cannot go. Very good, thank you. Two words. <laughs> Two words, please, take away from this session, at least. Courage and action. Nisha, take us into lunch. A round of applause for Lola and for <laughs> Anders. Can I, just one thing. Will, will I, can I have a bell now? <laughs> and second message, if you like to follow more what Sweden is doing in terms of global health, just some marketing, Sweden for Global Health at Facebook. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Sweden. you.